In this video, we're going to look inside the Decent Espresso machine. We're gonna talk about internals. We're gonna geek out about what makes this machine different than everything that's come before it. Now, I'll be doing most of the talking. Paul here is going to man the camera and point out things that I've forgotten to mention or things uh, that maybe need a bit more explanation. So let's just start with the front here. We've got the tablet, which is on a tablet stand, which can slide out. Now, I have already taken the screws off the, the cover here. Here, there is a switch, and we're gonna talk a lot more about that standby switch in a little bit later. And then here, if we look from the side camera, I'm gonna take this cover off. And now you can see inside the decent espresso machine. Now using a screwdriver, I'm gonna walk you through the various parts. Now, back here, you can see there's water coming in from outside. So this is the refill kit coming in here, dropping water through here through an air gap that is here into the water tank that is below. Now there's an air gap so that the water can't, under any circumstance except maybe a reversal of gravity, come back up through here. And that's a safety measure that's required for sanitation. So that's how we refill the tank. Here, and I'm gonna lift this up. This is the water intake assembly, and there's two tubes. This is the water tube, and the one next to it is the water level sensor tube. Okay. So the way this works is water is sucked up from here, and at the very bottom here is a little particle thimble that just is, works as a um, particle filter. So water comes up through here, through here, and then it gets split to the silicon tube into two pumps. The way that the um, water level sensor works is that there's a separate tube here, and this is measuring an air column pressure. So as this moves up or down, or as the water moves up or down, that little chip there has a wire that goes back to the PC board back here, and gives it accurate water level in the water tank. Okay, so here's how water goes in. There is a hot pump and a cold pump. Now these are electric terminals here, okay? And that is a thermal safety in case these ever were to get too hot. Now you notice they're inside rubber here so that as they vibrate, they hopefully don't make too much sound. And then there are these clips here to lock everything down. Since everything has vibration and movement, we try to lock everything down. You can see that's why there's tie downs here and here and here. Now down here, this is a connector here that was popularized by Nespresso machines. And it's a really clever little connector. When we have a better view of it, I'll talk more about it. But this is one of our secret weapons because traditional machines tend to use welded tubes. But the downside to that is as they get hot and cold, they tend to crack and leak. Whereas this is something Nestle invented that has neither of those problems. They don't crack, they don't leak, they're not susceptible to thermal cycling, and they're really easy to replace. You just pull out that little pin there and the tube would come out. So you've got a hot and a cold here. And the reason we have two pumps is that we use a water mixing approach. Okay. Maybe Paul, you're gonna hold the camera above here. And what's happening is these pumps, one of them is going here straight, and that's the cold water, or rather room temperature feed. And the other one is going in here. I'll show you the heater in a second. And then this assembly here has two sensors, one measuring the cold water temperature, one measuring the hot water temperature. And they mix in various ways through here. There's a bit of chaos uh, specifically in here because hot and cold water will tend to slide by each other rather than mixing. So that's what's happening through all this. And then this yellow and green tube is the main mix water temperature. And that goes into here, which is what we call our main manifold. Now you might notice every tube is color coded, every sensor is color coded, and often we try to give them meaning. So this is the input hot and cold temperature, and this is the mix temperature. There's a temperature sensor here and here. Those are temperature sensors. And this thing is basically the big railway station um, direction chooser for the water. And this is where we've got colors that mean something. So this light gray, uh, sorry, this light brown here 
is water going to the group head to make espresso. This blue is water that's clean, that's going to make tea or Americanos. And this light gray tube is for making steam. All right, coming back over here and let's switch over to this camera. In here, you can just make out that there's two heaters. Now the heaters are our own design. They have a uh, stainless steel tube that coils for two meters. And then mixed in with that stainless steel tube is a heating element that is right next to it, again for two meters. That whole thing is then encased in aluminum. And then that has a temperature sensor and two thermal safeties on it. And those are the two heaters we have. Now one heater is dedicated to steam and is typically, hitting, um, is typically sitting at 160 Celsius. And the other is our hot water path, and that is typically idling at 99 degrees, so just under boiling because it's not under pressure. When the decent heats up to make espresso, it will go above boiling because this is going to be pressurized at several bar of pressure. And that allows us to mix hot water and cold water at the last minute. So going back here, Paul, you want to show me that? So this is our auxiliary mixing manifold here. And what we're doing is whenever we detect a temperature here, which isn't what we want, we change the pulses on these. Now, if you're wondering why are we using vibratory pumps, these things that bounce up and down, as opposed to more expensive um, uh, pumps that are uh, either gear pumps or rotary vane pumps. And the reason is, is that each cycle of these moves a very small amount of water and they move instantly. As soon as we give it an AC pulse, we get water movement. Whereas a rotary pump or a gear pump starts up and slows down quite slowly. And so if we detect, for example, here that the water temperature is slightly too cool, we can do a couple pulses right here, literally a tenth of a second later, that will give us hot water. Now you'll notice these tubes here are quite thin. They have a 1.3 millimeter internal diameter but actually at the ends here where these come in, they're 0.8 millimeters. And the reason we use quite thin tubes is so that there's very little water that travels between here and here and here. So that a change that happens here happens maybe less than a second later over here. Not much water, not much latency. You'll also notice if we come back here that the color of these tubes is kind of a uh, cloudy white. Now these are solid Teflon. They're not Teflon coated. Nothing inside the water path is coated because coatings tend to come off, especially as things go hot and cold. This is considered the absolute top end. And in the latest top end machines out of Italy, the Pro Machines, you will see a bit of this as people move away from the solid metal tubing to solid Teflon. I'll explain why. This solid Teflon here, calcium will not adhere to it. So that's the very first thing that's really great because calcium will adhere to metal tubes. Secondly, it doesn't heat up or cool down very much and that means that it doesn't affect the water temperature. When we measure the water temperature at various points, it barely changes as it travels through the tubes. Now, I mentioned the removal mechanism for these tubes. Right here, if I put that screwdriver underneath there and I pull that tube out, I pull this clip out, this tube will pop right out and you'll see a little o-ring and the beauty of this is that this seal right here for example is actually not currently water sealed it's now loose and it's loose because the machine is cool and as soon as any water comes in the o-ring in there instantly seals it what that does is it prevents the enemy of espresso machines which is thermal cycling as things heat and cool down if they're different materials they expand and contract at different rates that's why a metal tube going into a piece of metal with some solder cracks because there's three metals there and they're all heating and cooling at different rates. With this, this tube is just laying there slack and you can see I can even move it a bit. You can see this here vibrating with me. And these things, despite thermal cycling on off, just they don't leak, they don't fail. If one ever did, you can repair it yourself. It's a little cheap o-ring we can send you. but. Honestly, I think that happens that less than a hundredth of a percent of the time for these things. 
Um, the reason that was invented by Nestle is because they made so many Nespresso machines and they needed them not to leak. So that's what's happening here. There's the manifold, the mix manifold, the heaters. Okay. Let's just open up this lid here. Now this lid was covering, yeah, let's get the let's get the camera really close in. Can you get it on that right above? Yeah. Okay. Super. So here's the lid covering the PC board compartment and there's two PC boards. This is the high voltage board, this is the low voltage board. The high voltage board, you can see it right there, has this big circular electromagnet on it and what that actually is doing is that's uh, the same as an electrician's clamp. Have you ever seen them put a clamp around um, your electrical wiring? That allows them to measure the current that's going through a wire and we do that right there for a very clever reason which is we're able to measure the load that each component is using inside the machine. So when it powers up, we turn on each component separately and we measure how much current each of those components is taking. So we can, and we do, turn on each valve separately, each pump separately, each heater separately. And if anything is using more current than it should, so for example, if a valve is calcifying up, we'll be able to detect it and fail the startup. So that's a quite neat little trick that I like quite a bit. Here on the computer side, this is very similar to what you might find in a mid-range Android telephone. Uh, it is running a operating system called Free RTOS, which is a real-time operating system, and, and it's a computer. Now, what we've got here, and I'm going to pull this off, This is a side panel access. This here is a Meanwell power supply. Now the reason we went with Meanwell is their stuff is incredibly robust. When I used to go to Burning Man, I asked this um, LED display club what they used and they used all Meanwell because even in the extreme environment of the Burning Man uh, festival and the sand and the dirt and the heat, these things never Failed. These are made in Taiwan and they're fantastic. So this is a sealed power supply that gives us our DC power. This is the 60 watt power supply. Besides feeding the computer, uh, it also does something quite important. So Paul, come over here so people can see. This right here is the power switch. And the power switch is constructed in a rather unusual way. What happens is you go back here, you can see there's an on-off switch, okay? And when I turn power on, I'm not going to do it since I have everything open, but when I turn power on, what happens is it turns power to the DC power, which then goes to the computer. The computer then says, is everything okay? And if everything is okay, it then sends power back to a solenoid there that engages AC power. Now that is a safety precaution because this is running a lot of software. And if the software does anything weird, like crash, for example, this has a little essentially dead man switch on it. So if the software here ever were to crash, the power is instantly cut. That CPU has to send out a pulse constantly in order to keep that power on. Now another safety is this standby switch here. And that's currently pushed in. If I push it out, it's now off. Now, showing you the switch here on the back. This is the switch and it's got a waterproof cap on it. And it is doing the same thing as the DC board is, which is it is cutting current to that solenoid. So that if you press this, you physically cut AC power. So that's not only a great safety, it's also what you might do at night so that you can leave the DC power supply charging the tablet but under no circumstances is it possible for this to warm up because you've actually cut the power. Okay, what else do we have? I am gonna, hmm, I don't know how easily we can take off the group head cover. That was something I meant to, or we can get ourselves, why don't we get ourselves a group head? Yep, sure. And then we'll do that, okay? Yeah. Oh, you've got one there. I've got a group head cover. Yeah. You've got a cover, but not a group head. Oh, actually, yeah, we have oh, a yeah, essay, yeah, from the last room. Oh, this is great. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. When we prepared earlier. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, I don't know, we got two cameras here. Um, so you've got Paul's, and you also have this one. Can you see that there? Yeah. Which is... Let's do this. Uh, let's go back to... There we go. That's way better. Okay. Can we go to the iPhone camera? Yeah. All right. Uh, just give me camera one for a second. We are opening up the top of this to show you what's inside the group head. Now that I've taken the group head off, this is the inside. Now the top of this is made out of brass. This is called the water path isolator. It isolates um, the water path from this because this here is all aluminum. Now what you can possibly just see is that you have this brass here and then there's this circular thing that's here. Okay. Now that is a fiberglass insulator. It's essentially a PC board. And what that's doing is it's completely thermally separating the water path, which needs to be at the exact espresso temperature, from the rest of the group head, which does not. Now this is one of our secrets for why we can start uh, making espresso so quickly, is that we only need to heat up this path right here, not all this. Not only does it let you start up faster, but it also means that you're not going to burn yourself as you touch here. It also means we don't waste electricity heating and radiating to your room all this stuff. All right, so what's going on here? Right in the center here is a cartridge heater. That's what these blue wires are. And that is measured by this temperature sensor, which is right there. That temperature sensor is right next to the metal, and when you are making, for example, a 92 Celsius espresso, on screen you can see something that says metal temperature. This is the metal temperature. This is the temperature of the group head. And you'll notice this sensor is right next to this. This is where the water comes in after it was mixed and checked. So it's coming at the correct temperature just back here. And then it comes in, and it comes into metal, which is also at exactly the right temperature. We then have some safeties. These are two fuses. So the European standard requires us to have um, thermal safeties that if they ever trigger, you can't make the machine work again. And they require two of them, so we have that. Whereas the American standard allows you to have a thermal safety which gets reset when the machine cools. So we decided to do all the standards all at once. So this is a triple safety. This is a thermostat, which is bolted onto this brass. If this ever gets too hot, then this trips. If this, for some reason, were to malfunction, then these thermal fuses would trip. Now, in practice, these things I don't think have ever, ever, ever failed. These are made by a German company, because I was convinced early on by the salesperson to buy the very most expensive thermal fuses, because I had heard that if you go cheap on these, they can fail, and then the safety is actually what takes your machine down, which would be kind of tragic. Uh, this as well, made by the German company and clipped on. So this is set for a lower temperature than this. So sometimes a thermostat might go off. For example, if you had a temperature sensor that for some reason failed, then the temperature sensor on this would kick in and cut power. Now that's happened a few times, not too often, but sensors can fail. So, then what we have over here are two more temperature sensors. Okay. Oh, I have made a mistake. Shoot. <laughs> All right, let me go in again. That is the metal temperature right here. This is sensing the metal next to here. This is the top water temperature sensor. And what this is measuring is water as it comes right through here gets sensed. And then this right here is the bottom water temperature sensor, and that is right behind the shower screen. So this is measuring essentially the extraction temperature. This is measuring the water as it comes into the group head. This is measuring the temperature of the metal of the group head. So a lot of sensors so we can control all this. 
One last thing I'll mention is the thickness of these things is something that we calibrate in order to get the locking angle exactly as you want it. So these are available in 0.1 increment thicknesses and we factory calibrate them so that one group head locks there so that it's exactly opposite the other one. The group head and the porter filter lock at exactly uh, opposite positions. I missed anything there. No, actually, I think... Um, right there? Okay. Yeah, right so there. here, um, I don't know that we have an O-ring with us, but um, yeah, I'll just show it. So this is what the end of a water tube looks like. It has a ferrule, an outer ferrule, and an inner ferrule. And the way this works is that a little rubber O-ring goes here, and then the clip holds it there. And basically, this pressurizes, all this just locks into place. What's nice is that you can pull this all apart. Now, this color here is not serving any function other than color. Okay, so this is what's called shrimp wrap. This is what's called shrink wrap tubing, which is usually used for electrical things. And we're putting it outside the Teflon tube for color on each of these things here. All right. So let's um, just show, I haven't shown the USB power, I haven't shown the uh, sensor assembly and flush. So let's go, let me give you that. There you go. All right, I'll come back over here. Uh, all right. So over here is a PC board where all the sensors come together and it's all labeled to tell you at what point they're sensing. And the reason we do that is to make it very tidy and also if a sensor were to fail to know exactly which one, you'll notice they're all color coded. And that's again, so if a sensor did fail, it'd actually be a repair you could do. You would just unclip the other end and unplug it in here and you'd be good to go. So over here is what's called the flush valve. And this flushes out here. Now, one of the things we've done that we think we're pretty proud of is this mirror here is hiding something. Now, can you see with that camera, Paul? You've got a little flush that comes out here. Now, in a lot of espresso machines, this comes straight from the top into the drip tray and kind of splashes you. What we did is direct it into the drip tray directly with this mirror hiding it. But even that isn't really a problem. It doesn't splash you because here, this box is a maze. So what actually happens is this tube here is holding the espresso pressure. And when the espresso ends, this valve here opens, this wire gets power, and then the espresso violently decompresses into this black box, which is a maze, which slows it down. So then it comes out through here. It does the same thing with steam, though a little bit of steam will come out here. Um, as part of the decompression process. All right, what we've got here is another safety. This is called an overpressure valve. I believe this is set to 19 bar. So this is not anything that really should ever, um, ever be used. <clears throat> and all this is doing is it's tapping into the main system over here in the mix manifold so that if everything else were to fail and pressure were to go above 19 bar, this water tube right here would flush into the water tank. This tube right here is doing something else. This tube here is when you hit start on espresso, water circulates from over here, mixes here, gets temperature set for a few seconds. Because what actually happens is for your first espresso especially, some of this stuff is cooler and is cooling your water. And we don't ever want to make espresso with cool water. So when you hit start on the espresso machine, you'll hear it go chug chug for a second or two. And what's happening is it's rejecting water as being too cool and it's sending it here back into the water tank. So it's essentially recirculating. Now that mentions also a feature here, which is you can heat up the water tank if your recipe requests it. So for example, pour overs that want a huge amount of very hot water. You can say, I want to preheat the water tank to 50 or, uh, 50 or 60 Celsius. It will suck it in from the back, go through the heaters, and send it back there until the hot water in the tank is at the temperature you want. Now, less and less um, 
people use that feature because we managed to get the heat on demand to be what we need. So at this point, the only people who are doing uh, that are the 110 volt customers in America who are doing large pour overs. They're the only ones who can't make hot water at the speed we want. Um, let's see. Uh, another safety feature is there are holes here on the bottom and the leg and the body assembly are actually fully separate. So there's four screws that's holding the legs to the body and there's an air gap right here. And that air gap is where water will come out should there ever be a leak because you don't want it to leak inside. So that's why there is a hole right here. I apologize to show that. That's why there's a hole right there. Should there ever be a leak inside, it leaks there and out the sides. All right. Yeah, I'll talk about steam. Let's, uh, why don't you come around here and I'll stay here. Now steam is made by pumping just hot water here and then come back around. <laughs> And then the water goes through both heaters. Now, depending on how much power you have, it'll um, be able to put power into both or just one. So if you're on 110 volts, what happens is the steam, or what happens is the water leaves the water tank, hits the hot water tank, which is not currently receiving power because we don't have enough power on the 110. However, this is already set to 99 Celsius. So it brings the water from room temperature to near boiling, at which point the normal steam heater will now bring it up to 160 Celsius. Now, if you are uh, someplace that has more power, then we're able to give this hot water heater more power. And the more electricity you have, the more we can put both heaters on to give you more and more steam power. Okay. And that's why, <clears throat> actually, I haven't mentioned, I haven't mentioned how steam works yet. The way that steam works is it works by flash heating the water to 160 Celsius. So there's a pre-warm stage here and then here. And what's unusual about this is that this tube that goes here does not have a valve. And the reason it's important is that allows us to heat our steam at energies that would not be allowed in a traditional boiler. A boiler is limited to, I think, believe 2.8 bar of pressure after which the safety authorities are worried the boiler might explode. And so we don't have that safety constraint because we don't have a valve here. It's open to atmosphere. So our double XL model hits pressures typical, uh, typically in a four, four and a half bar. And the triple XL model we've been testing goes all the way up to six bar. So those are extreme steam pressures. But more interestingly, the steam is extremely dry. That tube is two meters long. In fact, there's two tubes that are two meters long, the hot water heater and then the steam heater. So um, four meters worth of tubing before the water comes out of here. Um, okay. Um, I'd say that's probably why our steam makes such good microfoam because the foam is made by what's called the shearing uh, of the milk by a slicing action, which is the foam. You're right, you're slicing essentially the milk into smaller and smaller pieces. So with very, very high pressures, you're essentially very quickly cutting that milk up to very fine microfoam. That's also why our foam tends to be more stable. The smaller it is, um, the more stable it is. Um, our, I haven't talked about the steam wand. <laughs> There's always something else. Um, why don't I do that? Paul, you want to come over there? Yep. Let's see if, yay, okay, good. So the steam wand is cool touch. Now, what does cool touch mean? Cool touch doesn't actually mean that much. It's very simple to do. You just take a normal steam wand and you put a tube down the center. So that way the outside tube doesn't get hot. The inside tube is made of Teflon. And you can see that if I unscrew this tip here, 
And what I'm going to do is just put a little tool here to keep myself from pulling out the tube. Okay. So there's our Teflon inner tube, and it goes, it has an O-ring right here and an O-ring right here as well. The only place that gets hot is this bolt because this is all a ball joint and there's no way to have a tube through that. So the water, so the steam comes in here on this clip, goes through here, comes back into a Teflon tube and out here. Now the steam wand tip itself has another O-ring on it and comes out through one hole or three holes depending on what model you have. I do want to show you, and Paul, why don't you come over here and let's see if we can give them a good look at how this clip works. Now, okay. What I'm going to do here is this is our steam wand tube. And remember, uh, I have a video where I show how to change this steam wand for a different shape one, an L or the XL one. So if you want more detail, but essentially all you do is I wish I hadn't cut my fingernails. <laughs> Let me find something a little sharper. Aha! All, right. All you do is you use something sharp to get in there, and then that pulls right out like so. Okay. And that is almost like a paper clip. And then what I'm going to do is pull this tube out, and what always happens is the O-ring is still inside. So I'm just going to fetch inside and take it out. So that is the O-ring. So if I want to change the tube or repair it or clean it in some way, I take the O-ring out, clean everything, and then I put the O-ring back on like so. Okay. And then I just push that back in. You see how easy this is? Okay. And then push that clip right back on top. Like so. And we are all locked again. Now, I know this looks completely loose, but that's the whole point. That's why we don't have metal fatigue or thermal cycling issues here. This is now sealed thanks to this clip. This thing is super ingenious and it was patented by Nestle for a long time and is no longer under patent. So this is a really great system that we used throughout the whole thing. You'll notice this is all metal and that is something we did differently from Nestle. Nestle would tend to make these out of plastic. Um, we rather not have any plastic in the water path. So um, this is stainless steel right here. Okay, uh, let me, I'm going to put the steam on tip back on. And let's just have a, for, let's look at the back for a second. So you can, so the back panel has that magnetic panel, which hides this stuff. This plug here is the refill kit. This, as mentioned before, is the water from the refill kit. This is power from refill kit. This is electric power, and this is the on-off switch. So let's take this panel off so I can show you a bit about the back of the decent. Now, I also need to take that off. One thing you might notice is how you don't really need a lot of tools. How so much of this can be taken apart with your hands or just a Torx 10 screwdriver. So what we've got here is the back panel, and there's a fan on the PC board, the Ethernet plug. This is just air, and what we're doing when we put this panel here is, if you come up here, Paul, this is how we cool the machine. This is the main AC power board, and it generates a fair amount of heat, and you can see the back of it is actually metal. In fact, this is mounted on aluminum. 
and aluminum is bolted onto the back panel. So we never really have cooling problems because the entire back face is essentially heat sink for that. And furthermore, this fan is sucking air in from the sides. And we put that in there so that all the air is being dragged along the sides to go through here to go through the center, which then hits the PC board and keeps everything cool. So internally, we find that we never go over 60 Celsius, which is great because high temperatures are the enemy of PC board components. Now, this little thing here, we were worried that the thing that would be the first to become obsolete is communications. Now, this is a little Bluetooth board, and this is following the standard that Arduino's set. In fact, so this is actually an open source design for a Bluetooth um, chip. And you can also buy this exact same thing with Wi Fi on it. This here is a serial port, and this is actually running a tiny little computer, essentially an Arduino that you can then program and put things in. Now, currently, all this is doing is converting the serial port to Bluetooth, but we have had other people who convert this, for example, to another computer to have Wi-Fi, and we've got an accessory that's gonna be hanging off of this in the near future, so you can use a web interface to talk to it. Now, the reason we made this this way is, should Bluetooth 4 be obsolete, we would just ask you to take this out, okay? And then you plug a new one in, and now you could be on Bluetooth 5 or whatever the latest whiz-bang standard is. It's really not difficult, and you don't even have to actually open up the chassis to do it. You can get to it from this direction. All right, I think that's it. Let's go to camera one. All right, that is a tour of the Decent Espresso internals. Now, you did hear quite a lot about safety. And, and the reason is there's a lot of innovation in here, but also I, I don't, I'm a programmer and I've been programming since I was 13. And that means I have put a lot of software bugs into the world. Um, that, that is the reality. And I might program as well as I think I'm doing, but there'll still be software bugs. And so as a programmer, you have to design assuming your fallibility. Now, these machines are now quite reliable. We repair about two machines a week globally with over 8,000 machines out there. So repairs are not really something that are a constant problem, but I think that's because we designed with so much redundancy, so much paranoia, so that should anything go wrong, not only are parts easy to replace, repair, you can do it yourself, but also the machine shuts down so that it is immediately safe. So a lot about safety and a lot of separate components. The other thing I think that hopefully struck you was just how easy it is to take the machine apart and how easy it is to take key components, uh, let's say temp sensors or um, tubes. Any of these things are really easy to replace and a lot of them are stock. You can buy them off Amazon as replacement parts for other machines as well. Now, we sell all our parts at near cost because I don't believe in making money off your misfortune of something that's broken. But um, again, that paranoia should decent someday never be around. I don't think it'll happen, but you should worry about it. Uh, the components can be uh, found widely on the internet as uh, standard and the few things that aren't um, are widely available from us online. It is not restricted just to repairmen. Okay, um, thanks, for this, thanks for watching this deep dive on the Decent Espresso Machine internals, and I hope you give our little machine a test. Yeah, questions? Uh, what bar does the XL 143 reach? Uh, what bar does the XL, okay, so the question is, what bar does the 143 machine? Yeah. Um, so the question is, what bar, I assume, of pressure or steam? Steam. Okay, so the question is what bar of pressure does the XL steam reach? So the Pro and the XL machines are identical. They have the same heaters in them. The only difference is that the XL machine is that much longer. It has this back panel. It's a little bit taller so you can countersink it and it has this steam wand here. Otherwise, uh, physically the Pro and the XL are exactly the same model. To answer your question about bar pressure, it depends on two things. 
Depends, first of all, are you in North America, where you are on 120 volts, or are you in the rest of the world, where you're between 200 and 250 volts? If you're in America, you're looking at typically 1.4, 1.6 bar of pressure from the Pro and XL model. If you are in Europe, you're looking at something like 1.8 to 2.8 three bar. Um, if you're, say, in Australia with 250 volts, you might hit three bar. It really depends. The more electricity you have available where you are, the more power you can, you can get to your steam. Um, all our machines, however, will reach 13 bar of pressure for espresso. Okay, to, it would be great to see what in, in, a, in a spreadsheet? Uh, metrics, all metrics. Okay, well, the, the, the comment uh, is it'd be great to see some metrics in a spreadsheet for analysis. Um, we publish all sorts of stuff. So I need to know exactly what metrics you want to know, but um, certainly we do post stuff all the time. Other question? Do you want me to come over? I, 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 I don't know how to ask it. <laughs> okay. Let me... Uh, Uh, so the next question is less a question, more a statement, which I'll disagree with. And that they're saying is if we had a rotary or gear pump, we would be able to simplify some things. The problem is, is that rotary pumps have high latency. They're just not that fast to respond. And we're doing, um, first of all, we're doing 10,000 times a second adjustments to the whole system and 10th of a second adjustments to the water itself. One of the features we have is what we call channel healing, which is when we are using flow profiling and we detect that a channel is opened, we can see that the flow is increased, that pressure has decreased, and we instantly, and I really mean instantly, decrease the pump, and that heals the, uh, the channel very quickly. So that's a demonstrable way that a very low latency pump will improve your espresso. Um, so no, we're not moving to a gear pump. We don't have the precise control and the latency to do the water mixing approach um, and the pressure profiling. Ah, one thing I didn't mention, I'll, I'll just put it in here, you can splice it in. In order to do pressure profiling and flow profiling, it's the same thing that we do for temperature profiling, which is to say, if we detect the pressure or the flow needs to be different, we just instantly put a few more cycles of electricity into the pumps or a few less cycles. Uh, one last question. Mm -hmm. My machine was set to 220 volt. Do I have to change to 230 volt for more steam power? Please talk more. Okay, so the question is, he bought a 220 volt machine, or rather it shipped to him as 220 volts, but he has 230 volts. Do you need to change anything to have more steam power? The answer is no. The range that your machine is operating in is 200 to 250 volts. And essentially we make two models of all our machines, the 120 and the 200 to 250. And the reason there's two models is because the pumps and the heaters come in two different models. The electricity is different and you have to have different models. Once you have the right model, you'll just get more steam. So when we're putting steam in, we're uh, putting, we're connecting it to the steam heater. And so if you have more voltage, you're just gonna get more. Now, that being said, if your voltage is different than what we calibrated for, then you might want to recalibrate the pump so that using a Bluetooth scale, we can get the pump to, um, we can get the pump calibration to be exact to your voltage so that the scale is telling us what the pumps are outputting and everything's accurate. Mm -hmm. Where can we get the shirt? Where can we get the shirt? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> these are Minion shirts that um, I made the Minion using Stable Diffusion, which is an AI program asking for Minions that are drinking or making coffee. We do not have a license from the company that does minions to be able to sell these t-shirts. So I'm afraid I've only made 
a few of them, and they're for the staff who all feel that they're working as minions for our guru leader named Bugs. So I'm afraid that these t-shirts are for internal use only. I'm sorry. Okay. Um.